Good evening, uh, everyone. It's really a pleasure to see the Orange Tribune 2 so full today. I think this is our best uh, ticket box uh, since we started this adventure of the uh, BK Talks. Um, I'm very happy uh, to uh, have changed the formats of the BK Talk in this occasion. I think three months ago or even longer, I can't remember very well, uh, we were sitting in a um, departmental meeting via Zoom, of course, and Heidi mentioned the idea of organizing a talk uh, for Patrick because he was about to leave the, uh, the, uh, the faculty. So I think I remember I, w I, I hung up, the, we finished the, the meeting and uh, Lex, who collaborates with me uh, closely in the organizing the public program, said we should really change the format of the BK Talks and have Patrick be part of the BK Talks and give the lecture. So I didn't doubt or hesitate for a second and I sent an email to Heidi. Uh, this is why we are here today. Um, I won't uh, take too long. It is a pleasure for us to have Patrick give uh, this talk uh, today and be part of the public programs that we are trying to, to, uh, to produce and organize. So Heidi will let us know what's going to happen. Uh, several guests are here uh, with us today. With no more delay, please, Heidi, um, go ahead. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Javier, uh, also for the opportunity to open the BK Talks uh, series uh, to single speakers. Uh, and it is actually a, an enormous pleasure and a privilege to introduce uh, a keynote lecture in the series by a speaker who really doesn't need an introduction. Everybody knows him and he knows everybody here. Uh, Patrick Healy, he is our friend, our friend, our teacher, our mentor, our colleague, and our own philosopher in-house as I said, Patrick Healy. So although Patrick is a polyglot and a true citizen of the world, um, I think it probably hasn't escaped anyone here that Patrick is an Irishman. He was born in Dublin in a day in July of 1955. And the reason I mention his birth year is obviously not to put him on the spot, but because it is significant for tonight's event. It not only marks the beginning of a life, of a destiny, and of a journey that brought that life here, it is also the reason why we're all sitting in such close proximity in, in this orange hall or watching the live stream of tonight's event remotely from many different time zones around the globe, from the Netherlands to Hong Kong. Next month, on November 13th, Patrick will arrive at one of his life journey's destinations, his retirement from our faculty. Tonight, we join Patrick to commemorate the completion of the journey that he began with us two decades ago and to celebrate with him this achievement. And of course, we're also here to prevent Patrick from taking an Irish exit. So let's take a little and a brief look at some of the lesser known junctions in Patrick's journey that might have brought him here. He spent his formative years at St. Columbus College in Avon. From 72 to 76, he studied philosophy, of course, at the University of Maynooth. From 76 to 79, he continued his studies, not in philosophy this time, but in sociology and Semitic languages, among them Hebrew and Arabic. And from 79 to 1980, he studied medieval philosophy at the University College in Dublin, Ireland. These formal studies were only the beginning of Patrick's insatiable thirst and love for knowledge. His entire life has been a quest for erudition. But his interests and talents lay not only in philosophy, sociology, and the humanities. They are also given in his practice as an artist. This is what brought him over to the Netherlands, where he joined the Amsterdam art scene. He became an influential member and collaborator of the Amsterdam wing of the Free International University for Creativity and Interdisciplinary Research, a collective organization founded by influential Dutch and German intellectuals and artists. Josef Beuys, Heinrich Böll, Georg Meistermann, Willy Bongert, among others. In Amsterdam in the late 1990s, Patrick became involved specifically in the establishment of the Free International University's art collection, a social sculpture study with Waldo Bean, Michiel Damen, Jacobus Klockenberg, Hilario Hochstede, and others of his artist friends. Since then, well over a thousand artworks have been added to his collection, including some of Patrick's own artistic work. But that's not all. Since 1997, 
He's also professor of interdisciplinary research at the Free International University in Amsterdam. Parallel to his artistic endeavors, Patrick furthered his academic trajectory and joined the Faculty of Architecture here at TU Delft at the turn of the millennium. Together with Ari Grafland and Deborah Hauptmann, Patrick helped to establish the architecture theory chair and later the former Delft School of Design. His knowledge on philosophy, aesthetics, architecture, theory, history, the arts, literature, poetry, and so on, has become a cornerstone in our educational curriculum. And today, it largely shapes the philosophical and, th and theoretical work of the current architectural theory group. Over the past 20 years, Patrick's courses and lecture series have attracted thousands of students eager to know more on philosophy, theory, and architecture. None of them has ever been disappointed. His lectures are remembered for their magnificence and flamboyancy. I have always thought that more than philosophy itself, it has been Patrick's very unique way of embodying and teaching it that has enriched and inspired the minds of so many students. He has guided, advised, and mentored many of us in our own research work and contributed to the development of lasting ties and solid relationships among different groups and colleagues in this faculty and beyond. In this beyond, Patrick's intellectual life has led him through a prolific career with his sophisticated translations of the work of important artists and thinkers, such as Max Raphael, Karl Krauss, Karl Einstein, Walter Benjamin, and Enrique Bergson. It is hard to keep pace with all of Patrick's multiple and various endeavors, and much harder to do justice to his scholarship in just a few minutes. That's why it's always a good idea to keep in touch with Patrick and to regularly visit his website. Patrick is an esteemed and highly respected member of our community. He's also the embodiment of a Renaissance man, a true intellectual, a philosopher, a generous teacher, a poet, a writer, an artist, a highly educated, cultured, and charismatic individual with many and surprising talents. Patrick is the expression of proficiencies and values that are rare, if not unique. Wherever he goes, he always stands out in the crowd. In fact, he usually stands in the center with a coffee and a lit cigarette in his hand, conducting conversations and animated debates about any imaginable topic with amazing dexterity, peppering every talk with fitting anecdotes that never cease to surprise us, to amaze us, to make us curious. Students follow him out of the lecturing halls and flock to him and surround him in the same way that young apprentices and disciples follow the wise man. This, I believe, is one of Patrick's most incredible gifts, the ability to transmit to young and old the adage that philosophy and everything really starts in wonder. Alfred North Whitehead once famously said, when philosophic thought has done its best, the wonder remains. It is the remaining wonder that Patrick leaves behind for us here to nurture and to sustain. It is that wonder upon which we will continue building on the cornerstones he has so generously helped us to establish. So there are many little things that we might have heard but not no sure for sure about Patrick. That from a very young age, he learned to play the piano. That's, that as a young lad, he played golf and even practiced fencing. That he's an artist and an underground performer. That he has played parts in a James Bond film. <laughs> or that he is a flaneur, often spotted strolling along the Amsterdam canals. But what we do know for sure is that Patrick's knowledge on so many subjects and his exceptional interpersonal intuition have captured and maintained our attention and admiration for decades. To us, Patrick is as irreplaceable as he is unforgettable. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce Patrick Healy and his very fitting lecture, The Brick of... The Brick of Destiny, When Architects Were Gods, which will also be the last in a series of hundreds of lectures, the now legendary Healy Lectures on Philosophy and Architecture, that Patrick will give as, a, and as, as an active staff member of our faculty. So Patrick, the floor is all yours.
somebody shot me. Yeah, you got it? Oh, but that's, that's, yeah, that's a lot of reverberation, isn't it? Okay, well, I thank you very much. That, that's almost as close as one can get to attending one's own funeral. Um, <laughs> if, it had a, if it had been an obituary notice and I was still alive, I would have been extremely flattered to have heard these words, but I'm afraid I would have had to also have objected to the generosity of the characterization. Um, the lecture title is not that architects are gods, but when gods were architects. Uh, it's an important distinction because I don't want to appeal to anybody's internal sense, either of megalomania or of some lost heritage which needs to be suddenly proclaimed by calling yourself the divine. I'm very happy to see so many faces. I recognize friends whom I uh, whose friendship I still enjoy. Uh, that is a compliment to their tolerance uh, as much as anything else. Uh, in the presence of the dean and members of the faculty and distinguished professors, one of whom I know has made the extreme effort of flying from Brexit land uh, to the mainland. Uh, he's ex particularly welcome and, and to many others. And also to my very first professor here who took so much care of my day-to-day -day work and contributions, whatever they were to this faculty, uh, in the presence of Professor Ari Grafland. I'm uh, deeply honored by your presence, sir, this evening. So, uh, this lecture lasts for one hour. It's now less. It will be uh, 50 minutes. So I really have to go directly to what I'm going to deal with. And in order to do that, I have to push a button, or I think Lex is capable of, and I, well, that's a bit out of focus, isn't it? Anyway, on the left is the statue of Gudea of Lagash, and on the right are the Gudea cylinders. I'm going to attempt to introduce and make some comments about those texts as the very earliest text we have, the very earliest text describing the building process. So they're not ekphrases, they're not as we get in later uh, critical literature, loving descriptions of buildings. It's actually a, a text which allows us to watch an internal process. It is also one of the most extensive and important building texts from the ancient Near East. And Gudea, who is there on your right, uh, is a rather squat figure. The statue is made of diorite, an igneous, very hard stone but it polishes up beautifully. And any of you who've gone to St. Paul's Cathedral will know that the steps to, into the cathedral are diorite stone. He is the second dynasty of Lagash. That is to say, this, uh, is a, Lagash is a, stay, a city in southern Mesopotamia. And we're looking at the dates are towards the end of the third millennium. And without going into detailed discussion of that, let's just say, these texts are about 4,000 years old, little over 4,000 years old. The texts are on the cylinders themselves. The two cylinders which you see to your right uh, were excavated in the very early campaigns, archaeological campaigns, of Ernest de uh, Sarzec at Tello in a campaign between 1877 and 1900. And of course, it was the tradition at that time that the excavators or the excavating team on their campaign took half of the fines which they had and the rest went to the local governments or responsible authorities. A situation which has continued in Mesopotamia, effectively Al-Iraq, uh, almost until the last 10 years. However, there was depredation during the wars and there has been an enormous uh, loss of material, culture, in Iraq. The two of these objects, and they're a bit out of focus, they're hollow cylinders, and they have a rim of about two centimeters, uh, 61 centimeter diameter, 32, and 30 columns of writing. And as one scholar has remarked, they are one of the most skillful uh, masterpieces of Sumerian literature. 
So it's obviously in Sumerian literature I want to start. And of course, the first question I would like to raise is the obvious question that we all face. We don't know anything about this. The Sumer, southern Iraq, Mesopotamia, between the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates, alluvial deposits of river, mostly mud and clay, almost no stone, no precious materials, where in fact the marsh Arabs were still living effectively until they were taken away or their life was basically destroyed by edict of Saddam Hussein. This is the word and these cylinders as material objects clearly require a lot of context. What are they? Where do they come from? Why were they written? For whom? What is the sits im Leben of the actual production of such an elaborate scriptural and inscribed object? How did we get to read it? I have to leave that part of the story out. But it can be read. It has been deciphered thanks to the indefatigable uh, work of the Sumerian uh, scholars. And we are in we are able at some point to imagine that we can read and understand this, the most ancient text that exists. But I would like to say something slightly about the notion of text uh, before we go any further, because this idea of context, this idea of actually deciphering from a translation we make of a language that even at that time was no longer spoken. Sumerian had effectively become a classical language. It was overtaken by the Semitic northern-speaking Akkadians. And it was later then translated, and we depend on dictionaries, and we depend on later Semitic dictionaries and language sources to read these texts. So very often, there is a semantic field in which not only does the pivot point of the world wobble, but even our sense of what the meaning could be. It seems to me that this issue of text and context is also part of our being able to understand this as this inscription as a work of poetry, and poetry as a weaving and as a, and as a, as a making weaving, and we find that thanks to the researches of Martin West in his magnificent 2007 uh, Indo-European poetry volume, he says that in Indo-Iranian, Greek, Celtic, and Germanic languages, we find poetic composition described in terms of weaving. From the Rig Veda, we can quote, Asma idukanas sid deva patnir, Indraya Arkham, Ahithaita Uvu. So for him, for Indra, the women, the wives of the gods, have woven a song at his killing of the dragon. And then, Ma Tantus Kedi Vayato Diame, don't break the thread as I weave my poem. In Greek, the metaphor of weaving, we have a beautiful poem has to do with pleco, to play, to plate, plating and weaving and tying knots in the hair. Probably a lot to do actually with hair decoration, an unwritten chapter of the, the history of poetry. Uh, unfortunately, I have to, I just want to read from that. In Greek, the metaphor is familiar who pino weave from the same root as the Avestan verb and the semantically close pleco. And these are repeatedly used by Pindar and the Bacchylides with such objects as song or words. So this idea that you're weaving and pleating is also a part of how the text array or the text is created. From Irish, Enrico Campanile adduced an early example from the early text Amre Column Killer, which by the way is very important to early Dutch literature. Uh, the Voyage of St. Brendan constitutes one of the great early medieval Latin texts uh, in which the actual Irish voyagers, the 
monks who came here uh, is translated. And there it says, fog, ferb, fitter, which simply means, and you will notice the alliteration, fog, ferb, fitter, means that the uh, master wove words. Much of our discourse making is indeed just that. We are weaving and unweaving the shuttle of thought, and we are trying to create, if you like, a, a pattern. We are placing ideas together. We are often unable to even say what the end uh, process will be. The next verbal idea that Martin West introduces, very valuable, is the idea of the tectonic itself uh, as a kind of poetry. The Latin for weave or plate, of course, texere, so architecture. So the tech sound there in the middle has to do with weaving, has to do with plating, and it's used in the Latin at least as early as Plautus, uh, where in the Trinumus 797, quam west sermones possunt longe texier. So that's one of the earliest sources we have for that actual use of texere or texier, but it's also employed, not just in respect to placing and weaving, uh, in the context of building ships. So, <coughs> or other wooden structures. And this is certainly an old use, as its cognates in other European, Indo-European languages are associated with carpentry. The underlying root is tex. In the Vedic, we have taksan, carpenter, and the corresponding verb tax in Avestan, the equivalent tashan and tas, and in Greek, of course, tekton. Of course, tekton and tiktine sometimes was a little joke that was made in Greek, which meant that you could be pregnant even as you were weaving something for the future offspring. However, it's not often made, but some people have tried to make a context of this texturing of the tiktine and the techne of the tassan and the text itself. So you see there's a very dense interweave or plating, if you like, what I would call a conceptual node, which is actually vibrating, if you like, within an expansive semantic field. And sometimes the very particularity of words like this become much richer than the abstract universal of talking about the history of architecture and picking out these isolated monuments and saying, these are the great achievements and this is what follows from them, usually a vision of decline or lack of progress, or whatever. In all of these languages, <laughs> Greek, for example, tecton, carpenter, builder, and tectai, no, I construct and fashion, and tech, nay, craft. There is no word for art with a big A. Techne, poesis, poetry, carpentry, architecture, these are all techne. See? but so is speaking language, so is rhetoric. And what we'll see when we come in the last half hour of this talk to the text of Gudea, of Lagash, is indeed that the understanding of the building process itself relates very much to an interrelationship that stands between the earthly and the heavenly, the divine and the human, and finds its richest expression, at least in the Sumerian, within the actual context of dedication, of devotion, and of humility. In all of these languages, the word text roots are used of poetic composition. So the Latin use of texere may be long in the same sense of building. So we have, and we forget that, that you can construct and build a poem. So when we look at Homeric lines and these very precise hexameters, and they are highly structured, they are highly constructed, one can say. And we have this beautiful phrase in Avestan from the Rich Veda, and this Vedic evidence is important because it may be the only other evidence we have which is as old as the Sumerian evidence, except that most of it has no documentary proof, but we do believe that the oral tradition may very well go back to the third millennium, may go back 
four to 5,000 years even. And there was such a tradition of repetition and of learning to recite, which is still happens with uh, readers of the Al-Quran, that it is possible indeed that the great Rigveda hymns contain very old thinking indeed about the notions of construction and building. So, um, f just one sentence there and then we leave that. Apurvia uh, purutamani asmai vakas si taksam. Now that tak you've heard before, that's your build. So, apurivia, unprecedented words, I will fashion for him. So, one is fashioning the unprecedented. I'm immensely grateful to Professor Martin West's uh, book for all of the information I've just uh, exchanged with you. Now, I, of course, thought I was going to speak for two hours, but I'm not. I'm only speaking for 50 minutes, so I have to skip most of this, and I have to go pretty... I think I have to go fairly soon, in fact, and directly to the cylinders. That'll be fine. I mean, it would be nice to be here and talk for days and hours. But one of the things I wanted to say was that we all have a view that we know what a temple is, or we imagine temples. <laughs> but we still depend enormously on actual texts in order to understand uh, what were the responses to the temple. If you go to the Pergamon altar, for example, it's not a temple, it's actually an altar in Berlin, you see that over many of the figures, the names are given. So that by the Hellenistic period, people didn't even know who those gods were. They, they, they needed help with the iconography. We're not in a dissimilar position, in fact, than those Hellenistic visitors. So we have depended, largely we know, that from the 7th century BCE, before the Common Era, we know that architects are signing their name uh, to buildings in Samos, for example, the Herion. We know that architectural treatises are being written. Uh, there is theory right at the center of practice. We know that uh, this theorizing has been maintained and rescued even as late as the period of Augustus, the Princeps, in the first century BCE, through Vitruvius's writings. We know that most of the vocabulary, most of the theoretical input of Vitruvius is based on Greek sources, exactly as we find with Cicero, that most of his philosophical work is directly based on his encounter with the Greek. And of all of those, surviving pieces. One of the most beautiful, apart from, of course, Iliad and Homer, are the hymns, are known as the Homeric hymns. And we'll see why that's important to our later discussion. The hymn being sung. Can we just take, we'll take a little second break because as ever, I, I've marked this twice and I've lost it twice. So, second moment. I don't know where. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay. Foibe anax eka erge epostitoi en fresi tesso entade pe fronais. Tuzai Pericaleia Neon. So this is an address to Apollo, who is the far shooter. He is Phoebus Apollo. He's God both of destruction and of creation. He is also a healing God. And the great discussion in the hymn is where and who will honor the God by building a temple for him. And he is told by the compiler of the poem, Phoebus far shooting Lord. I am going to say something for you to take the heart. As it is here, you are minded to make your beautiful temple as an oracle for humankind who will ever come in crowds bringing you perfect hecatombs. So, we're talking tourism. The island of Delos 
is being specifically told, you don't have much here, you don't have water, you don't have vegetation, but build yourself a temple. In other words, use a cultural religious institution or, and regenerate your island. So to try and think of temples also in this much broader economic function is one of the things we'll see is quite important for understanding the, 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 the temple work in Lagash. And the great student of that uh, is um, Mario Liverani, the Italian Roman scholar who wrote a book on Uruk in Italian, published in 1997, translated into English 2002, thereabouts. Fantastic book, 100 pages, beautiful understanding of the relationship between, for example, the assemblage and the meeting point that is a temple or a major building, and also the various kinds of economic and other social processes that have to take place. And he points to within the alluvial deposits of the intra-riverine uh, cities of me southern Mesopotamia, he points particularly to the way the field system is organized, that a monocrop such as barley becomes used, that corvée labor is introduced, which is a kind of almost feudal system of labor, where you have to give 60 days of your year free of charge. Uh, that's usually extracted by the university in the form of having to do things you never knew were in your contract. Um, so corvée also is a funny word, isn't it? It's, it, it? it's French, but it actually ends up in Czechoslovakian by the Kapesh brothers becoming the word for robot. Yes, it's a very interesting history of that word, I must say. Um, but Apollo is addressed, and it is said to him, if, if, if this temple is built here, economic prosperity will follow. I will speak out, and you must take it to heart. You will always be bothered by the clatter of racehorses and of mules being watered from my divine springs. Here people will want to gaze at well-built chariots and the clatter of racing horses rather than a big temple with a mass of wealth inside it. No, if you would take my advice, of course, you are more powerful and nobler than I, Lord, and your strength is supreme. Make it at Chrysa in the hollow of Parnassus, because obviously their racehorses wouldn't be making so much noise. Now, the issue of noise is precisely the reason that the Sumerian gods decided a flood would have to be sent, because mankind was making far too much noise. They were clattering and shouting, they were screaming, they were demanding, they were cringing, they were complaining, they were woking, they were me too, whatever. The entire cacophony of complaint and dislike, and the god said, we've had enough. Let's flood them. And it was only through a very complex conversation that it was decided that some of them should be saved. So, I think I wrote this in two directions. So, it's, so I have to, I think that doesn't, no, that doesn't. So, it must be, yes, I'm now going to read, and that's really the end of the lecture, it goes like that. Um, but I have to find it, excuse me. When we look at Greek temples, we have a view that we kind of know what they're about. So we, but we don't really even know how we know that because we've, uh, none of us almost ever walked into a Greek temple. We've walked into restorations, we've walked into ruins, we've looked at books with enormous illustrations, with reproductions, with imagined dimensions and sizes and scales. Where is the Greek temple? We've never been part of a festival crowd. We've never prayed to Athena or to Apollo or to Zeus in Olympia. We don't have a religious orientation. How can we understand any of this? How alien is this? Can it ever be reconstructed? By us, at least. How can we reconstruct in a secular, as Weber has a disenchanted world, anything that belongs to the unknown, the ineffable, 
the mysterious, the tremendous, the awe-inspiring, all of these taken as, if you like, descriptions of religious awe in that famous work by Otto, Rudolf Otto, called The Idea of the Holy. How do we understand a sacred sanctuary space set apart? For what reason do we pay attention to this? When we know what we don't know, it's also good to realize, that, as Martin West once said, that an unanswered question is better than one we haven't asked. So I'm asking these questions, and I, in order to try and answer them, not because I was suddenly guessing religion, <laughs> that certainly wasn't the case, I just wondered, how could we think about this? How could we think about something called a cosmic mountain? The idea that, let's say, after this flood and getting the riddance of these noisy offspring created by the gods, the waters subside and a primordial hillock emerges. And that's the place where the water had just covered the earth. Well, in some sense, when we're talking about the Mesopotamian, southern Mesopotamian Sumerian ziggurats or temple structures, we are talking about an architectural orientation where the temple is said to express the movement of ascension towards the heavens as a staged tower and a monumental staircase which leads to the upper part of the tower. Some scholars have suggested that this is the omphalos, that is the navel point from which the creation of the world took place. And this also gives us another clue that the center is constantly centering itself, that the inhabitants between the rivers constantly are compressing the point of their own notion of the center. And that center is where, in fact, contact is made with the heavens, with the divine, and with the underworld, or in the old <laughs> Babylonian word, or in the Enuma Elish, uh, the Apsu, the, the primeval waters, where the actual meeting of the primeval fresh water and the sea waters is the fundamental mythic theme of the Enuma Elish. And it's strangely, if you come to the end of James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, it's exactly the same theme of the freshwater river Liffey going out into the sea. And it's old and sad, sad and old. I'm going out on my cold, sad, weary father, miles and miles, the moaning of sea silt, salt sick, until I rush. Oh, so this is the river Liffey is going out into the sea. And it's seen almost as a kind of father-daughter relationship. It's a, it's, it, it, it's a kind of theme that Joyce picks up from Wagner in the Liebstod. It's right there in the Enuma Elish as myth. But it isn't such a distant myth because the temple, as from what we understand, is embedded in the Apsu and it reaches into the heavens. 22 minutes. So here we go. Take a very deep breath. Uh, <laughs> this is not going to be slow, okay? <clears throat> so, first of all, we have this idea of centering, then we have this idea of focus. So, we have this idea of focus. So, the actual building is a focus, but for what? For organizing and validating the political and judicial power. The temple, then, is a cosmic link center, focus, link. It links the city to the deity by providing a permanent dwelling place. And the very word in Sumerian, a, and if you say a gal, that simply means a big house. One is a house, the other one is a big house. So the temple is a big house. Uh, now, if you bring that into Assyrian, a becomes a bitum, and buy it, and so on and so forth, into Hebrew, Arabic, Ugaritic, in all of those languages, we have that same basic idea. That it is a house, it's a cosmic link, it is an actual, uh, there is a propensity of flows to the people, 
from the well-fed and honored God. In other words, part of the temple's house was the curating of this house was also a means of assuring that the God was provided not only with necessities, but that actually this would be returned to the people. This reciprocity, this double, if you like, helix movement of giving and of bestowal is essential to the idea of dwelling itself. Therefore, the temple can also be described as a topocosm. It had to be kept in good condition. It had to have a space for what is called the tablets of destiny. So we have, for example, in the text of Gudea of Lagash, we have a, not only an example of a building, but also a rebuilding and a remodeling that is taking place by one of the cult participants. And of course, there we insist that the temple in ancient Sumer was first and foremost a domus dei, a house for the god. Lagash, of course, dominated by temples, uses the temple as a sociological process of stabilization and reinforcing of social mores. We can also say that the temple and the cult is itself an index of society. So the same point is made in the Italian scholar Liverani, Mario Liverani. It's a wonderful book, 102 pages. Ah. After all the pages I waded through, this was... And he says, a good destiny for the ruler who builds Gudea displayed quality and reinforced the legitimacy of his rulership. So in some sense, we can talk about a vast ideological project, and in some sense, we are capable of deciphering, even though we don't always know the context and the sits im Leben. Again, I cite Liverani, religious character of imperial ideology, is the form of that ideology in general, an alchemain. It is the code, and it's not part of the message. So the temple had to be built under ideal conditions, because it is the code. Imagine those programmers now with AI who are busily creating codes to create autonomous weapons. Well, it's something similar. There's nothing new in this, and the laws of destruction and construction seem to continue. But what we can observe then in this is that the whole community is involved, because the community had to be maintained in a state of physical, moral, and ritual purity. And it had to exercise a moral economy. This is exactly 1,670 years earlier than Aristotle's notion of a moral economy, picked up, of course, by Marx in his early writings. So, one can refer to the temple economy, but not to a state economy. It is revealed by the god to the ruler, but the dimensions and the internal design. Now, Jonathan Smith says that focusing everything has significance, argued also by the great anthropologist Van Gennep, as rites of passage in his essay, Pivoting of the Sacred. I quote, that is, there is nothing that is inherently sacred or profane. So we shouldn't begin with this kind of dualistic view of the holy and the not holy. These are not substantive categories, but rather situational or relational categories, mobile boundaries which shift according to the map that has been employed. There is nothing that is sacred in itself, only things sacred in relationship to. From the strict concern, we will now go in conclusion to the actual, my, <laughs> yes, yes, I'm sorry, please excuse me. Uh, I think it's the other way. So we have a minute's break and then there's 15 minutes and it's done. Yes, I, I feel like a dentist. I'm trying to tell you, don't you won't feel anything. Ow, horrible. Um, yeah, I have it now. No. 
I don't understand. I, ah, there it is. It's only when I saw the. That's it. Okay, the final part of this lecture, which was never meant as a provocation. Somebody thought that oh, this is clickbait. This is, you know, there is a thing called a brick of destiny. There is a person who has a whole ritual. It is hugely significant for architectural building practice. One, one. I'm now presenting a paraphrase, quasi-translation, if you'll pardon, pardon the phrase, uh, just to get through the material, the thickening material. From one one of that cylinder, the first reading, we have on a day when destiny was being determined in heaven and earth. Please note the homology. Destiny is not just in heaven down, it's also being determined on the earth. That, that double link is never lost. Lagash lifted its head towards heaven in great form. Lagash is the city. Enlil looked at Lord Ningirsu with favor. Enlil is effectively the father of the gods. He's the creator of the flood. And Ningirsu is his son who brings the spring rains. So water, water. And as you know, the Sumerian sign for water is ah. He saw fit to make the ordained city appear as resplendent, this is a beautiful phrase, he saw fit to make the city as resplendent as a long lost thing. Of course we should spend a lot of time thinking about that sentence. What could that possibly mean for practice, for understanding? And there the, the the Sumerian says, Uru mea miul pan mane pae. To bring forth. Pae is the verb to bring forth, to make manifest. We are at the moment where destiny and manifestation meet. And he saw to make the seasonal flood occur. In other words, both the historical cycle of repetition in the flood of the seasons and its ever returning must be essentially maintained from worship towards the very powers and forces that have brought that into being. It is the Tigris River, which is to be seen as fit place for bringing sweet water. Flood is also the overfill of Enlil's heart. Later in Assyrian, that's Libanu. There is a pun contained between the Sumerian and the, and the Assyrian but that's too much to go into. Yo eye lugal be gubade, concerning the temple, then he proclaimed the ruler must arrange to, he had caused the decreed brickwork to lift its head towards heaven. Yes, the pure temple to be built, raised its head towards him. And suddenly we realize we've been now in the text for almost 18 lines, and suddenly we realize that was a dream, that somebody is dreaming this, and then we are told who is dreaming it. It is none other than Gudea, of whom there are 27 known statues. Many of them have had their heads cut off because it was a, a damnatio memoriae. When you captured other cities, you grabbed the statues. Because these statues were not made as a kind of, you know, a spectacular version of his own narcissism. They were made to be put in the temple to represent him and continue praying and worshiping the god. And also, there's a little secret in that statue, which I'll point to as my very last, I think, concluding moment. So, a night vision. So, he commended Gudea to build his temple, and that is in Eninu, its image being the greatest. Eninu mebe galgalaam. Galgal is always big. So, Lugal is a big man, that means king. They, these are very easy usages. Gudea was overwhelmed and said, surely I must tell it to her. He means Nanshe, Sipame, as the shepherd. I am the shepherd. So she entrusted me with the office of authority, but I didn't know the meaning of that, which <laughs> had been brought. And there the verb again is saksi, which means to take care. So we have manifestation, we have light, 
we have taken care, we have Gudea's dream. He's actually being incubated. He's very worried. He needs to find out what is the meaning of this dream. What is the Lord named Girsu actually asking of him? I must take, he says, my dream to my mother. Amamu, mamumu, ganatum. And the dream is interpreted by her because she is the best interpreter of dreams. So we got on his Magur boat. He set sail to Nina, her city on the river. And there, of course, it turns out in 2.14 that Ningursu, let me build your temple for you. He realizes that he needs to invoke Ningursu to build the temple. Let me perfect its form for you. This prayer and petition was accepted, but he had to consult with another goddess and celebrate an actual festival associated with the phases of the moon. Set his bed then close to Gatum Dag. We have a second period of incubation. She raises up the head, lives in the land who knows what is, ideal in the city. You are the queen, the mother who founded Lagash. So, Ama Nutukume Amanu Zeme, he says. But I have no mother, I have no father, you are my mother. His dedication to the god is such that all forms of kinship are eradicated because he now dedicates himself to the interpretation of the incubated dream to be allowed to build for Ningursu the perfect temple. And because time is against me, at least, perhaps not you, I have to rush to my conclusion which I need to do almost without notes. Uh, but simply to say this, in the cylinder we are then told there's a sudden moment of sunlight all around Gudea as he's in his sleep, and the manifestation is that a lone woman comes to his bed holding a stylus of a metal whose identity we don't know. It's called in the text Kanake. We don't actually know what metal that is but she was holding a stylus. She placed the tablet, heavenly stars, on her knees and proceeded to consult with it. Now, as you know, in the British Museum, uh, next February, they'll be showing the famous star map of Nebru uh, from Germany, which has created a lot of Bronze Age discussion. But here we have the earliest reference to an actual star map being used by the goddess to interpret the dream and to give uh, Gudea, the actual precise instructions which he needs in order to build the temple in Lagash itself. And if you look, it's rather difficult to do, I will admit, which I, have, I, I believe I have seven minutes. And she proceeded to consult it next to warrior who had a slate of lapis lazuli he bent his arm and held a slate of that was Lazuli. He was sketching, I, I, I'm now translating directly. He was sketching the design of the temple there. He stood in the holy carrying bucket before me, prepared the holy brick mold, and placed the decreed brick into the brick mold before me. The reference, by the way, to the British Museum is the Stonehenge exhibition, which I suppose is... Uh, on the 22nd of February, and it's the Nebra Sky Disc from Halle in Germany, which shows the sun, moon, and stars, and also uh, other cosmic phenomena, precisely as laid out here. Except here, the agricultural dimension of the rain and the waters, obviously for the Mesopotamians, is more important. So he consumes, says his vision was that of her brother, she identifies the young woman, she proclaimed to you concerning the construction of the temple according to its holy stars, and he was copying the plan of the temple. And you will be delighted to know that sitting on his knees in lapis lazuli on this diorite statue is indeed the earliest architectural plan of which we have evidence. And certainly the earliest plan about which we have also supporting literary and textual evidence in the form of a royal inscription or an extended hymn or a literary project in which the cylinders of, of Lagash are the very main source. 
So he enters the temple, there's a silent assembly, things are purified, the fat of sheep is used, because as you know, if you put incense into fat, animal fat, the oil gives. The gods are very knowledgeable about cooking. And in a second dream, and that's why they need certain fat from animals and certain incense. Their preferred incense in Mesopotamia, I should mention, is cedar resin. And part of, if you read this, and you can find it online with a lot of text, but if you read it, what it comes through is they're obsessed with getting carnelian, with cedar wood from Lebanon, of going to the Zagros Mountains to get obsidian stone. The actual contrast between the poverty of the material world in which they live, of brick and mud, is relieved by objects of enormous value. And this is something we see them using lapis lazuli cones in the facades of, of, of large brick buildings. We see the usage of very rare wood for the doorways. We see the importation of copper and tin from Cyprus for bronze. And indeed, for those who are interested in the socioeconomic development of networks, it's actually those merchant nodes of, of, of obtaining uh, resources, rare resources, that, that, that really create the mobility of that vast cultural interchange between Lapos Lazuli in Afghanistan, all the way through the Indus Valley from Harappan culture, exchanging indeed along the Persian Gulf into lower Mesopotamia, all the way up the rivers to North Syria, to the Assyrians eventually, to Turkey, Anatolia, the Hittite Kingdom, back down to Cyprus, over to Crete. <laughs> I mean, this is the network and node and city and harbor and merchant and exchange and story and thing. And this all involves enormous fusion of peoples, of languages, of multicultural resources. That's the picture we have from this ancient and beautiful text. So in conclusion, there's a wonderful image about the cedar wood being cut in the mountain in Lebanon, going down the river like a snake on which bright light shines. The, the other goods are alabaster. And at 1717, we hear that Enki prepared a sketch because he wanted that the temple would be known in its fearfulness. In other words, the other big value for the design is not just about precious goods, it's about the awe and sublime that attaches to these great communal structures of the ziggurats a ladder, a uh, stairway to heaven, in the words of a knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door, and so forth. So I believe that I commend to you to read this text. I thank you very much for presenting me with this opportunity of saying farewell. There's a line in one of the Duino elegies of Rilke, which says, rather matter-of-factly in the German, uh, Doc, so leben wir on Naaman Ima Abschied, which Stephen Spender decided to turn into a, an iambic pentameter, which sounds so much more plaintive, nostalgic, elegiac. And so we live our lives forever taking leave. Goodbye. Thank you. <clears throat> I understand there's a question and answer. Yes, there is. Uh, dear Patrick, thank you very much for this. Uh, that was just half of it. <laughs> that was just half of it for this very short voyage uh, into space and time. I would uh, like to give the word to the audience here. I, I'm sure that there are comments and I don't know if questions or things to say from your friends and colleagues at the faculty. So please, uh, we are keeping the uh, COVID protocol still, so we are not passing microphones. And uh, I would like you to please come downstairs orderly in order to make your questions or comments or uh, things to say to Patrick. Please just come downstairs freely and uh, talk to Patrick. Thank you. Nobody wants to break the ice at a moment like this. 
So I shall talk to myself, and I will interview myself on why I only gave half a lecture to say a full farewell. But you know, I, I'm slightly leaving the door open that I might be invited for the second part of the lecture somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do you not have a question, Xavier, since you started this? Oh, there's, there's somebody uh, coming over you here. see. Uh -huh. Sorry. Thank you so much, Patrick, for this terrific performance. I, one of the thoughts I had is that, you know, when we teach history of architecture, of 20th century architecture, we speak a lot to our students about the shock of the future, the shock of the modern, and we frame the history of modern architecture in these terms. And when listening to your talk, I was thinking of the shock of the past, which is unpredictable, and the past not in the sort of, you know, linear way, canon canonical way, but across these, these established narratives. So I was wondering, from your experience now as an educator, I was wondering if you could share with us what did you think was the role of the past, and even that, precisely that, that, that very ancient past in teaching architecture? In yes. Architecture school? Um, can, can everybody hear it? Yes. Um, and when I first came here, I remember working with Professor Grefland, um, and we were being savaged by the history department. Um, you know, that theory, had no knowledge of history, wasn't interested in it, and I said, Absolutely nonsense. I mean, there are two ways you study philosophy. You either just philosophize, hmm, and you haven't read anything, and they, these are exceptional people who do that, or you usually learn that there was somebody called Plato and Aristotle, and that many of those arguments can be reprised again in Aquinas and the medievals, and oh, and strangely come up in analytic logic discussions in the 20th century. So by dint of hard work and historical work, you can actually gain a foothold within philosophical uh, work itself. Um, so it's a very good question, but you know, in some ways, the problem of the past, we always talk about it haunting us, but it hasn't yet arrived. Because if it's really past, it's never been present. So the only moment its pastness becomes available to us is when we put it right in front of us, as in those two pictures. You know, I mean, you could come as an archaeologist and I've just discovered those buried out there for some reason. And what do you make of it? I mean, so material culture and context and sitzim leben and, and meaning is, goes in the reverse direction. We understand, first of all, through meaning, and then we narrow down. So if you like the Aquinas question of ansit, is it the case that something is, is not the question. And the quid sit is not there just to keep adding adjectives so that you finally get at some kind of essence. The past is what reminds us that we don't have those kind of essentialisms. But it's not necessarily a relativizing move. We can actually say something about the language, the object, the situation, and like you, one has the sense of the shock of that. Because what we're looking at here are highly mobile assemblages that are coming together as social factors as much as any other. We are also looking at realms of forces and powers at play in which certain kinds of material poverty is being harnessed and generated and then restored and rebuilt all the time because the community keeps itself going through those actions. In the same way as that the uh, Athenians don't put many old people on the friezes of the Parthenon simply because the youthful democracy is always busy with its own ideals of the demos. And the biggest problem of the demos is that it can vote. These are the turkeys that can vote to abolish either Christmas or themselves. So democracy has that profoundly precarious human frailty, beauty, you can say, which is what the gods cannot enjoy. The gods are, are eternal. 
They envy the mortals. They envy that we live. They envy the fact that in this finite world, with maybe not a lot of meaning available to it, we go on. And I know you're an author of books, and you have a very distinguished academic career, and, and that is the life of spirit. And that in-betweenness, if you like, between the divine and the human is just spirit and matter constantly working on mind, mat, and so on. I think that's still quite a significant... That's what I learned from reading this, that maybe there was a time when people were closer to the, to the divine, but at least it keeps some kind of, if you like, uh, pressure valve from exploding. If you say, I made this and heaven knows, or you know, it's being judged by powers greater than you, it might prevent you actually becoming a megalomaniac. And this was exactly the point where when the letter was sent both to Heidi and myself, I said, oh no, but it's actually the opposite that all of this has to say. And that God's architects means that they have given us divine plans. There are structures within the universe and world that are divinely sanctioned, like perfect circles, like in the Timaeus, it's forms of geometry and so forth. But they also are products of human mind. Sorry. Well, I'm happy to go out and, you know, it's now five past seven. If there are no pressing questions, I should sit over there, okay. All right, Good. we're gonna give the word to uh, two friends. Uh, first, I would like to invite Ari Hraflan to join us. Please take the floor. I think actually that you might, uh, you can use this microphone. That's gonna be easier than uh, I think. Oh, it's working, okay. Should I sit there? I better say nothing indiscreet with this microphone yeah. going, you know what I mean? People have had their careers ruined by forgetting that those things are listening all the time. You know? yeah, I, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Why don't you sit there? Because Heidi's, I couldn't sit on that orange. Oh, that is like from the 1970s, like space cadets material. I know. I know. And I'd never get out of it. You'd have to I get know. a team to pull me up from I never figured it out the depths of that supine, it. you know? Okay. <laughs> Let me stop. I think it 21 years? Yeah. Yeah. That's a long time. Um, I was trying to remember how you got here. And I remember, it was Deborah. Deborah met you in another faculty, a lecture, or whatever. And she said, I hear somebody which is very interesting. And you don't go against Deborah. So that's how you got on board, no? And that was the time that we were teaching uh, Roger Scruton. And that, of course, for you is an unknown uh, figure for the most of you. but. Scruton is a very peculiar philosopher because he is, he is probably one of the most conservative thinkers in England. He died recently, a very prolific life. He published many books. And we were teaching a book, The Aesthetics of Architecture. But you have to realize the context where that happened. And that was in the former building of Van der Broek and Bakema. full-blown modernistic building. And Scruton is somebody who is trying to define what is architecture, and he says architecture to, is essentially a decorative tradition. For thousands of years we have seen that. So students will have to read that book and, and come together in meetings with each other. They were all trying to reject that because everybody said, well, sorry, but I don't agree with that. I mean, but that was ex ex essentially the idea of the Scruton lecture. So reading the book, at the end, they had to admit, well, he has an argument. 
And that was the idea. I mean, it was never the idea that you agree with Scruton or whatever, but that you're trying to build your own arguments. And you were, of course, in that time, you were, you learned what modern architect you were. Van der Broek and Bakema were a very, let's say, that kind of modern, was a very dominant at that uh, period. So for them, it was a kind of very strange book they had to learn. For us, it was beautiful because you could learn how to build your own argument against somebody or in, uh, possibly with him. So that's, I remember that you were um, starting in that period, let's say the Scruton uh, years. And then soon after, that was the so-called theory chair. Um, I can't remember, I think Sonus left already at that time. Um, so we um, were sitting together, the three of us, and trying to figure out what we're gonna do in the next period of time. And that was an idea that we might try to link research thinking, philosophy, etc., to the design practice. I'm not an architect, but I've always thought that students in this facility should do both together. Not only, as in many other schools, you have a, a theory department, theory history, and I was always of the idea that you should try to combine that so that in the process itself, you see what theory can do for you, if it can do anything at all. But when you got on board, you were still what I would call the Amsterdam period. Heidi has already mentioned that briefly. I'm not gonna go into that extensively. That was the FIU with uh, our neighbor, uh, Babette. And that was your time that you were directly connected to people in the art world in Amsterdam. You produced a big book, by the way, in that, um, uh, in that period. Uh, in the f in that uh, what it was the name of that was on on boys and uh, um, well forgot the name but it's yeah on Kloppenburg and Walter Bing that's right so that that was a time that you were directly also in uh, let's say the uh, practice of 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 arts in Amsterdam. And I could look into my thesis too, but I think what for what? What is what has disappeared? idea. <laughs> Don't worry, it won't go. <laughs> and then we sit together and we figured how can we combine this and then uh, I don't know who did this but then we thought we, we need a, a small kind of design school inside the building. That was the beginning of what is called the Dell School of Design, a kind of a big name for a handful of people but still we're trying to get um, let's say this, the design world and the theory world and philosophy together in one kind of a platform. Complex way to work, but I think in a way it's that, that worked. It was not about, let's say, des design practice and how you do this exactly. That was, of course, done by the architecture department, but we were probably more on a little distance from that. And then we started to organize things. We had a I think we had a conference in, in 2003, four, whatever, yeah. And then later on, years later, um, the first book came out, it was Crossover, that uh, Leslie uh, Kavanaugh was there. And I, we did that together, that was a, a kind of a monster of like that size. Yeah, 700 pages, I mean, crazy, you will never do that again, but. Um, and also in that period, we, we had a, a strange, um, project, it was called Camera Eye, Mark, uh, Mark Baumeister did that. You wrote about that also, uh, I remember, and that was about the theory of perception and how design could relate to that. It was very outside what, what students till that time uh, saw. I remember that Lane, Lane Van Duyn, who was a colleague of mine, uh, said this had nothing to do with architecture. Well, it's, he was right, not in the traditional sense. It was a kind of experimental thing. Okay, Mark later also came on board and he also did a PhD. And then um, you have been, to my mind, the pillar of the DSD. Together with Deborah, I, I mean, th she was always uh, on board on that sense, but you have had so much influence. Uh, 
when I came out of a meeting, I sometimes needed you, and then I asked around, where's Patrick? Patrick is talking to a student outside. You had your cigarettes, and that's typical, because you, you were always directly with students. They were always after you, and they were always asking, Can, uh, what? And you keep smoking. <laughs> yeah. Well, go on with that. I mean. <laughs> so in that sense, you're the kind of a, a classical professor to my mind. I mean, you're, you're directly involved with students. Uh, you write, you publish. Um, you were one of the most important uh, people to my mind in the Delft School of Design. I mean, um, the, the, the DSD was not the darling of the faculty. We had a, a tendency to, to use a lot of money. Uh, and and that, that was uh, not always appreciated, but that's how it was. Um, the books that, that I appreciate a lot was, was a book that you built, The Model and Its Architecture. That's one of the DSD books, and that is, I think, still today is a wonderful book for students. I don't know whether these things are still available, but that's, it's, it's an oldie, but it's a very good one. You had also with Sun, um, the um, publisher in Nijmegen, they don't exist anymore, but you had um, Images of Knowledge and Beauty and the Sublime. Beauty and the Sublime was, of course, very also close to my heart, but that, I mean, I was happy to see you also with Sun because they had a an kind of an important influence for the faculty here, published a lot of material that was, you was hard to find. They translated a lot. They had one of the most fantastic editors to my mind, I think Hooks who passed away, but he, is, he was one of the, let's say, really uh, intellectual uh, publishers. And we try to do our best with body and architecture. There's one cognitive architecture, both done by Deborah. Uh, and you had wonderful pieces in that book. I, I small parts. <laughs> well, small parts, but uh, it's, it's a lot. And then there was another issue that, that was footprint that uh, was originated um, by Tal, Tal Kamina and, and Lukas. Lukas Steinek, he was just putting in a, a question. Um, Tal, by the way, is, is teaching now in Cardiff. He's a director of, of research, and, and Lucas is a professor in Manchester University at the moment. And you were in that, in that journal with Max Raphael, one of your ongoing projects, I would say. And I remember that Footprint was, was, um, was a difficult start because they had, the guys had to really figure out what... Um, is the world of academic publishing at the moment because there were strong uh, journals in the States. And we, we have to find a kind of a slot for that. And I think that is succeeded wonderfully. It's, there is a whole range at the moment of, of, of issues on footprint. And, and I mean, I'm out of it now, but the people I've spoken to, they all know it. They, they and, and a lot of students and PhDs, they work on that and that's also for a, a part, thanks to you. That was also in the period of time that, that uh, Rumer van Thorn, my, my friend Rumer, stepped into the DSD part-time. He was working for uh, Berlage. We trying to link uh, once in a while. Um, Rumer is uh, now a professor at Umea in Sweden. And I have to say he completed his thesis and I've, I've read it, I've, I've, I've seen it, and when it's out, you have to buy it, because it's a great book, really. Um, also from the Berlag was uh, Miguel, Miguel Rob Robles Durong, um, my Marxist friend, so to say, <laughs> incredibly. But it's, um, that's, a, that's another story. That, that was, um, Isabel, Isabel Doucette, she also came in a bit later, and Karen, Karen uh, August, and you remember that you have helped her along the way with uh, uh, Kantian and Gregory, of course, yes. Um, Isabel is, is now a professor in Chalmers in, in, in Sweden. Um, one of the books that was also published in that time um, was a book on South Africa, 
uh, Gerhard uh, took the initiative. That was a, a faculty-wide um, uh, thing. There was a conference, uh, there were publications, and that was um, African Perspectives. That is a, a book that's also done uh, by us. That um, relates to another funny project that um, I was also teaching in Germany, in, in, in Dessau, in that uh, famous uh, school. And this Heidi and, and Garrett, we did a, a, a studio, a design studio on what is called the Damascus Gate, which is an, an, a really existing site in, in Jerusalem, which is so conflictuous, it's incredible. These people really hate each other, and we're trying to get an improvement in the area by redesigning the area, uh, and m many students um, f gave up, because that the moment you really start to see what the political issues there, there are at hand, they kind of drowned in the complexity of that thing. And, and so you see how small things in architecture or urban design can be so complex that um, you can't even compare it to the, to the Dutch situation here. That is on something you also wrote about, I, I remember, and, and we talked about these things a lot. Um, so the Damascus Gate was, was um, one of the things that um, I appreciated the talks we had about that. And then I get to my, the final one, which is um, the critical and clinical cartographies. That was um, born in the school because I was just coming by with, with Heidi and, and uh, Andre for a coffee. And we talked about what we're doing and, and I was out for years already. And I was talking about a project as I was related in Miss Humboldt uh, University in Germany. And you might remember that, that there came a beautiful conference out of that idea. Heidi and, and, and Andre organized it. You were in that, uh, preparing that thing. You have helped them with, with, um, um, with other people, by the way. There's not only that. There was a Kass Oosterhuis was involved in that and Harriet Beer. And the book that came out is, again, Stavros uh, has one of the introductory texts in that on architecture. And that, um, to me, was a kind of very nice and interesting thing that you also uh, had a, a strong influence into that. Working on that, uh, I must say, this, this Humboldt thing, I also realized how fortunate we were here in a financial sense. Uh, Jacob Fokkema was, was the director and he liked us a lot and that made all these things possible. In Germany, I couldn't move around because there was virtually no money. And then you see how, uh, let's say, helpful uh, the College of Amistur has been in that sense. So Jacob, uh, thanks again. And then, Patrick, this is it. You're leaving the ship and it's not the end, because we both like Walter Benjamin's um, work, the passage work, the arcades text, etc. And in that, um, Benjamin says, the, let's say there is a kind of wrap around, that the outside is coming inside, it's the, the streets. Yes. The, the war, yes. Yeah, so it's the streets are your interior in a way. So you, you, you walk there and that's how we meet basically. That's, we both are city walkers and I see you in the streets and we have a coffee or whatever and it's a kind of floating thing you pass by. It's that I hope we will meet again in that sense, for certainly in, in Amsterdam. It was a pleasure and an honor to work with you. Thank you and be well. Dear Patrick, I would like to say a few words in gratitude as your friend, collaborator, and former student. I remember that in one of your lectures, you referred to a poster of Justin Bieber seen on the streets of Amsterdam and pointed out the various ways 
in which the image related to classical sculpture and ancient modes of representation. All of a sudden, the letters of Winkelmann were brought to life in the age of Instagram. In similar ways, you could, during a lecture, refer to the spatial configuration of the lecture room or, respectfully, to the lives of students. As an educational device, these kinds of interludes successfully woke up the sleeper cells among the attendants, but it would be wrong to only regard them as a tool to engage the audience. Looking back, I realized these moments contained a much deeper truth, that one cannot escape the past and that it has a continuous presence in our lives. Through your lectures and tutorials, you've awoken our awareness of this presence and the many forms it can take. It is thanks to you that when viewing posts on Instagram of archaeological finds in Pompeii, I think about the revival this would have instigated through the spread of drawings and engravings in 18th century Europe, while simultaneously drawing an analogy to the habit of pinning, retweeting, copying, reposting in today's virtual space. Your approach differed from how I had been introduced to architectural history and theory before. The historical presupposes a gap between present and past required to separate subject and object. Through the works of Walter Benjamin and Max Ravel, you showed us, however, how the past is held in a kind of suspension whose components become distinct through our active analysis. This requires the subject, subject's engagement rather than disinterest. In physics, it would, this would be called the observer effect, the disturbance of a system through the act of observation. We are always implicated in the creation of history. Active analysis, working through the past, not frozen thought, but the process of thinking and analysis, this is what you taught us most. And by refraining from the use of PowerPoint, you made us all participate in this process. It has struck me how even those students who branched off into building management still held your course in high regard, and how friends still talk about your lectures as something they can return to, pick up at any moment to elevate their current lives as practitioners. Any lecture would make us realize the limits of our knowledge, but it would also lay out a path to acquire more. Isn't it the greatest achievement of any teacher in higher education to instill the permanent thirst for knowledge or wisdom as the ancient would prefer in students? Interestingly, in the case of your lectures, you achieved this by taking us more seriously than we took ourselves at that point. You criticized the pampering of students to take too much care for those who can take good care of the, for themselves. By addressing us as scholars, it opened up the possibility of us being scholars. And years later, you would still remember former students based on their intellectual interests and address them accordingly. At the same time, you always remained accessible, generous, and polite. When we once discussed this, you pointed me to Seneca's letters, who wrote, the very name of philosophy, however modest the manner in which it is pursued, is unpopular enough as it is. Imagine what the reaction would be if we started dissociating ourselves from the conventions of society. Let our aim be a way of life not diametrically opposed to, but better than that of the crowd. Otherwise, we shall repel and alienate the very people whose reform we desire. We shall make them, moreover, reluctant to imitate us in, in anything for fear they may have to imitate us in everything. The first thing philosophy promises us is the feeling of fel fellowship, of belonging to mankind and being members of a community. Being different will mean abandoning that manifesto. In many ways, an interesting quote for us to digest today. I want to emphasize the feeling of fellowship and of belonging to mankind. It's indeed philosophy which can bring us to the superhistorical dimension in which, which we can feel united with the living souls of the past as fellow travelers. It shares this with architecture, always in dialogue with the past. It still deems relevant and alive, even the modernist maxim of breaking with the past, confirming that. Your lectures have shown us that critical historical inquiry is possible without shunning the mythical dimensions of the past, as it appears to us when we least expect it. I consider this a gift to the faculty. To conclude, I would like to point the members of the audience to Patrick's website, uh, patrickhealy.com, with a hyphen between Patrick and Healy, on which you can find many digitized versions of his work, ranging from 
uh, academic books, essays, and translations to poetry, paintings, and readings. Smoking. Smoking. <laughs> Patrick, on behalf of all your former students, it has been an absolute privilege to have you have had you as your, as a mentor. Thank you very much. And firstly, I'm looking forward to continuing the uh, Max Rafa project. I'm sorry, Patrick. I don't want to embarrass you any further, but uh, it's an honor to be able to uh, also speak to you in this uh, very special occasion. So, dear Professor Ahidi, you were never appointed at such, but for me, you're the real professor in this room and in this building. And I think you will always be that. Um, yeah. You have been named many things already uh, this evening. I don't want to add too much uh, to that. Uh, but for me, you're uh, the real professor, the educator. You brought a lot of uh, inspiration, insights, uh, very unexpected ways of looking at our strange uh, profession of uh, being architects and studying uh, architecture. Uh, you brought real wisdom and you brought because uh, Heidi also said, also a lot of color to our faculty, and that's also something that we need here. So, yeah, on behalf of the whole faculty, I want to thank you sincerely for that. Um, and I think also tonight, uh, it's a great example of uh, ah, what we are going to miss. And I really hope this was not your farewell lecture. I really hope you will come back now and then. Um, but I will certainly remember this lecture in front of our own ziggurat, the orange one, yeah. But I also remember very well the first lecture that you gave uh, that I was able to attend. I, I had just returned to uh, the Faculty of Architecture, being appointed here, and it was in a series of, of lectures, and you stepped in for an invited guest lecture that, you know, one hour before the lecture started, uh, told us he was not going to come. You had not prepared anything. He said, well, I didn't prepare anything, so the only thing I can do is I will do an alphabetical lecture. I will start with the A and then continue. And it was really sad when you were at the E, you were stopped. I think by, yeah, because of the time. But I think it was the best lecture of the whole series and I really missed the part. <laughs> from G to Z. Well, I think maybe tonight you uh, did the G, but so please continue till you uh, have arrived at the Z. So I really hope we can see you back and uh, thank you so much for everything you did for us. And to give that a little bit more meaning, you guessed it. <laughs> It's a, a, a present I want to give on behalf of everybody here, but also the whole faculty. Don't thank me, I think we have to thank Heidi because she organized this, but she gave me the honor of presenting it to you. Thank you very much. To do it in the privacy of your own home. However, I take this risk. Ah. It's not a dinky toy, is it? A fire brigade. Oh, it's Lego. I knew it had something. I thought it was going to be a fire brigade or something. Mm -hmm. Something inside for you. Open it. Does it pop up? Yeah, no. Ah. This is yours for you, ah. from all of us. The black book. The black book of goodbye would be a good title for a novel. Thank you very much.
And I steal the moment from, uh, from Javier, thanking Javier and Lex very much for the, the incredible help they, they uh, offered us to organize this whole thing tonight. And I uh, thank all of you for having come, having sat in close proximity, and having shared this important moment uh, in Patrick's uh, career. And as uh, Dick already said, hopefully this was part one of uh, other parts. So I close the event and I thank all of you really, really a lot. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>